Hello everybody, how's Psychin' Law doing today? Here we go, we are at the penultimate lecture, that's next to last, we got lecture 15 here, uh, and we have a homework assignment based on this one, so let us get to it. We're going to talk about punishment and sentencing with Penelope for a while, uh, certainly a topic of interest to her, or not, she lives a pretty carefree life I must admit. First, let's begin with type of sentences. So when someone is finally sentenced, we can kind of classify sentences into three rough groupings. The first might be determinate sentencing. These are sentences that are fixed by statutes and sentencing guidelines. And these become increasingly popular. And remember our discussion of discretion and Samuel Walker. Uh, determinate sentencing is really minimizes the judge's discretion in sentencing. Okay. So sentence is essentially determined by legislators and prosecutors and this really then feeds into what we've discussed previously, the hidden power of prosecutors. Right? Prosecutors get tight with legislators, legislators work on behalf of prosecutors, they then develop statutes that say, hey, this crime, this sentence, that's it. Uh, the judge does not get to, uh, you know, exercise any judgment in this regard. So, now intermediate sanctions are tailored punishments to fit the crime. A and intermediate sanctions are often used with uh, relatively minor offenses, right, and, and certainly nonviolent crimes. Psychologists are key in determination of punishment. Often they testify as to uh, the person's mental state and uh, the goals of the punishment in this case. Now mixed sentencing is where judges might have limited discretion and this would be for example mandatory minimums. That is, you know, the, the range is 10 to 50 years with 10 years minimum and then the judge is allowed a little bit of discretion in this regard. So, that being said, let's move on and discuss the goals of punishment. And in the Tetlock Lab, we did an awful lot of research on punishment. Uh, and one of the angles that we took in investigating punishment is the punisher's motivation. What is it that the punisher, right, the state, the jurors, who, whoever is in that situation, is trying to accomplish and what motivates them in that direction. So when we look at, at punishment, the, the gold standard uh, uh, of punishment is retribution. That is an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. And we see this across many different religions is this is kind of a tenet in the way people should be punished. Now some punishment is driven by moral outrage and, and these are crimes that offend the sensibility, they offend the values of a person or a community. And, and we see people people punishing as the result of being aggrieved in, in a moral sense. So their, their moral outrage then brings down the sword of Damocles, if you will, uh, onto the offender to make it right within the community. Now, when we look a little more scientifically, we can say, well, think about it. Many crimes and the publication of the punishment, and remember we have an open system, so trial by jury or trial by judge, but it's supposed to be a public trial. And when we talked about, back with Miller and Bolster, what is the purpose of the trial? Well, in part, we could argue that the purpose of the trial is to educate others as to potential consequences for their actions. Let me ask you this, how many of you have robbed a bank? And you probably don't want to admit it anyway. So, but let's just move on from that question. How many of us have robbed a bank? Because think about it. The advantages of robbing a bank are, are pretty significant. If, if we rob a bank, there, there could be a lot of money. Uh, we derive a sense of power walking into the bank and commanding everyone to do what we say or there'll be trouble. But the thing is, we also know what happens to bank robbers bank robbers get severe punishments. So we say, wow, if I rob a bank like those other people rob banks, then it's likely I'll receive the punishment that they did. So punishing a bank robber serves to general, in general deter the public from committing the same type of crime. General deterrence think making an example is a, is a way to look at this. 
Okay. Now, individual deterrence is to deter an individual from committing the crime. And typically, this is kind of more of a recidivist attitude that is com punishing someone so they don't commit that crime again serves as an individual deterrent directed at the individual who potentially might commit the crime. So we often sanction people as a result of their behavior, saying, hey, don't do this, because if you do this again, look what's going to happen. You're going to get punished like you did, or maybe even worse. So individual deterrence. Now, sometimes incapacitation is the main goal. Now, this one might be a little rare, and I'm, I'm going to talk about this a, a little more. Uh, we had a problem researching incapacitation. Uh, we know it exists. But to what extent? And, and, and let me give you an example. Uh, if someone amazingly uh, pisses me off, sends me into a stage of moral outrage, uh, I develop this motivation for retribution against this person, then I might want to put them on a chain gang doing hard labor, right? And we're going to march you out, or maybe we want to embarrass them. We want to march you out to the side of the highway, and we're going to have you dig ditches from dawn to dusk. We're going to break your back with this hard labor, right? And hard labor was often a component of punishment in the past. This is, you know, to make the person suffer, to make them feel pain. But let's suppose, let's talk about uh, an extreme case. Let's talk about Charles Manson. And what do we know about Charles Manson? Well, as you might remember, Charles Manson convinced a whole bunch of other people to murder other people on his behalf. Ultimately, Charles Manson is a scary dude. And I don't know that I want to chain him up with a bunch of other prisoners who he's going to twist their thinking to his goals, etc. Uh, you know, I, anger, sure. It, it's, we can be angry at what Manson did, but maybe the primary emotion in processing the crimes that Manson committed are, are really fear. So incapacitation maybe makes more sense. Is there some way that I can lock this guy up securely and probably in isolation in some kind of solitary regime where he can't influence other people and perhaps turn those people against us, the state, what have you. So incapacitation is a goal. Uh, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, I'm not going there. I just want this guy locked up, throw away the key so that he can't harm anybody else. Now, we've got two more on the list, and uh, kind of so far down on the list, and, and, and not jokingly in a lot of respects, is rehabilitation. And this was really kind of one of the original goals of the penal system in the United States. When the Quakers operated prisons, right, uh, the idea was rehabilitation. And what we're going to do is we're going to put you in a cell, we're going to put you in solitary confinement, we're going to give you a copy of the good book, and the, the solitude, the quiet, the Bible will all help you get yourself on the right path. You sit in there, you contemplate your life, you com contemplate your relationship with God, and, and you come out rehabilitated and ready to join society. Now, modern-day rehabilitation often centers around teaching skills, uh, getting GEDs, college education, moving through various group kind of therapy sessions to uh, essentially rehabilitate. And we often hold this up as a goal, but uh, a little more on that in a minute. And then restitution. Now restitution, really what's restitution about? Paying back the damage you did. Restitution we see often more in a civil uh, arena, and, and that is someone aggrieves a party, there's a financial uh, loss as a result of this, or pain and suffering that needs to be compensated, so people are asked to pay back, that is to pay restitution. Now, we got seven punishment goals, and, and in our research, uh, you know, people would read crime scenarios, and then they would determine the nature of punishment, and we would often ask people, you brought your ribbon up here, your favorite toy, look at you, you want to share that with everybody. Oh, what a good girl. We would ask people, hey, how much do you want to punish? Uh, you know, things like, was this crime foreseeable? How accountable should this person be held for this crime? Etc. Uh, what legitimacy do you place on the excuses, alibis? But then one of the questions we often asked is, what is your ultimate goal for the punishment? 
So, when we ask Ohio State students, and I'm talking literally thousands of Ohio State students have participated in our research, and I love Ohio State because I, I think that Ohio State, what do you think? Is this middle America, isn't it, Penelope? So, I, I think when we do our research at Ohio State, we have a representative sample of the United States uh, in, in Ohio State, a nice balanced sample. And we ask people, hey, what's your goal in punishment? We don't ask it directly like that. I'll show you the fancy questions we ask. <laughs> Ultimately, what do you think? Of the seven that I showed you, what do you think? There it is. By far and away, the leader of motivation was retribution. Uh, so for better or for worse, and that's not the issue, this is just empirically supported, uh, that, that people's primary goal, at least Ohio State students, is retribution. And I think that scales up, that's representative of the population of this country at large, the majority. Now, how do we know this? Well, how do we know this, Penelope? Yes. Do we give our participants red ribbons and see how they play with them? She loves this thing. It's her favorite toy, right? Don't buy cats expensive toys. Take a piece of ribbon off a package, a gift, right? And she's been playing with this for a year. It's, it's her favorite thing. She's so proud of it. So, retribution. Here's some of the questions we ask. Now, some of these questions, and I'll, I'll warn you, are worded a tad, would seem a tad awkwardly. I took these questions from research we did here at Ohio State, and we did simultaneously in Singapore because we wanted to compare individualistic culture versus collectivist culture as yet another component of our series of studies. So what happens with these questions is, we would write the experimental materials, we would write the scenario, we would write all the questions, etc. And then we send them to Singapore and they would translate and then we bring it and we back translate it. So we try to go back and forth on the language to develop a compromised uh, manner of vocabulary, uh, uh, it's a compromise, not a compromised, it's a compromise expression of these ideas that makes the two questionnaires as equivalent as possible, thus enhancing its kind of cross-cultural reliability. Uh, it's, it's never perfect when we do this, and, and you'll see. But this, this is questions we asked. The scenario was about JL, and JL had uh, been drunk driving, and we had a bunch of, we had four different independent variables, variables we manipulated. Uh, but what is the response to JL and his drunk driving, and in the worst case scenario, uh, hitting another car and killing a mother and child in that car. So, specific deterrence. Well, we ask, to what extent are you trying to make sure that JL never does anything like this again? And notice, that's specific or individual deterrence. That is, what about JL and how can we shape JL's behavior? General deterrence. Make sure other people get the message that jail's behavior is unacceptable to society. That is, functions as a general deterrent. So each one of these questions has a nine-point scale. To what extent was this your purpose in selecting the punishment you selected? And then we could compare the level of uh, importance of these two between the participants. Retribution, and here was the winner, right? Make sure JL experienced some of the suffering he's inflicted on others by his deeds. Ooh, eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth, right? Now, this one is akin to rehabilitation, but notice, we're talking about Singapore and a collectivist society, so their motivations might differ slightly. Re reintegration into community by humbling. That is, send the message to JL that he must live by the same rules as all of us, that he's not so special. Wow. And how, <laughs> I, you know, personally, I, I wish we did more of this in the United States. There's uh, the biggest proportion of crimes committed is committed in this country by white males in the 1%. And, and what the, the, this, for some of us, we believe this is the approach. That is, uh, boy, you're not so special. You can't get away with this, uh, and, and you're going to have to pay. Now, straight up rehabilitation is to help reshape JL's values and personality so that he can function effectively in society. And we see that captures more of the individualistic culture's form of rehabilitation. 
Uh, and then here's another one is to affirm the value that society places on the lives and self-respect of innocent, innocent victims of the crime. And then finally, my purpose might have been to compel jail to compensate his victims for the harm he's inflicted on them. So there we see that that would be best uh, described as restitution. Now, additionally, moral outrage has a strong role, too, and, and that's why we kept it separate. You know, you say, well, it sounds a lot like retribution, but it may or may not be. Uh, moral outrage, then, what we're talking about is to what extent did this crime and this person's involvement in this crime anger you. We reduce it down to anger and we often assessed participant emotions reaction to the crime uh, in, in our research as well. And so in this case the level of participant anger what we found almost always predicts the amount of punishment assigned to the defendant. And I, I know you say, oh, well, thank you for that, Dr. Obvious. No duh. I get angry. I want to punish more. But uh, Rucker, Polifroni, Tetlock, and Scott were the first people to ever demonstrate this empirically, so we, we get to claim it, I mean, through our research. And, and what we found was that when we factor out participant anger, right, then the relationship uh, to punishment absolutely disappeared. So anger is the explanatory variable first choice in understanding how people are going to punish. Now, if I was a prosecuting attorney, then what I have to do is present the case in such a way that the jurors become outraged, become angered, and that will likely increase the, uh, their finding guilt, if you will. Emotions are a powerful tool in this regard. A and remember that Clarence Darrow, I believe it was, when we were talking about jury decision making, he says, I look for a jury with as much emotion as possible. And it's emotions that are easy to sway in one's favor. So, now, we hadn't given up on incapacitation. I mean, retribution is key. But Rucker and I really wanted to explore the circumstances under which people favor rehabilitation. And that is, could we actually create, create scenarios where we could predictably differentiate or predict participant reaction? Could we create scenarios that would put the majority of people towards incapacitation rather than retribution? And, and, and the key here was, specifically, we hypothesized that anger leads to retribution, and we got a lot of empirical evidence in our lab, as well as other research to demonstrate that. But could we make up the fear equals incapacitation link? And unfortunately, we tried all forms. We, we tried using different types of crimes, descriptions of criminals in our scenarios. We even went on a long journey of priming people with emotion-laden uh, you know, we would put people into an emotional state in the laboratory and then have them read a crime story. All to naught. We could never differentiate uh, retribution and incapacitation. And, and that's an interesting story in itself, but it's a long story. And if you want more on that story, please take Psych of Emotion with me because I explained the studies that we did very uh, very explicitly, but when we start talking fear versus anger, we start moving into the territory of psychology of emotion, so that's where I present it in that class. I work hard not to subject you guys to a lot of recycled material, uh, given how many different classes I teach, so there you go. <laughs> and notice that <laughs> it's a horrible advertising technique. If you want to hear more about this, then take this class, right? So. Regardless, let's shift gears and let's talk about bias in sentencing. Women, at, at first glance, seem to receive lighter and or more often suspended sentences. But this is a correlational form of research, and, and we know the correlation doesn't always equal causation. Let's trot out that old trope, right? Women less likely to have previous criminal records. They're less likely to commit violent crimes. So the sentences are more likely to be suspended or lighter in nature. A more refined study would need to be, you know, uh, to make sure that all else being equal between men and women. So now non-whites, offenders with black victims get lighter sentences than those with white victims. And we're going to return to this point a little later as well. Interestingly, notice how, how, you know, we would think, well, okay, so non-whites get stiffer sentences. 
and, and that's for the perpetrator. But notice that the race of the victim matters in the determination as well. So Georgia's study, now this gets the other half of it, black men twice as likely to be incarcerated for the same crime as a white man. Okay. So my bulb, I've lost some light here. Oh, now it's back on. Is this shorting out? Wouldn't it be awesome? Oh, is it going to catch fire and burn down my caddock? I better keep an eye on it. I built this light bar, so we better be suspicious, right? Now, the special case of sex offenders, and, and we're getting close to our homework here, the first part of it. The special case of sex offenders. Sex offenders, are, you know, it's thought to be special case and develop special requirements within the justice system because the idea is that a sex offender is internally motivated to sexually offend and then they're not their be future behavior is not likely to be shaped by punishment. They're more likely to recidivate, the, to be recidivist, that is, to commit the crime over and over again. So we tend to believe or perceive them to be recidivists. So when we look at sex offender laws, right, rather than, you know, run-of-the-mill violent crime or non-violent crime, but we see three goals. So I'm going to go one at a time each slide with a new goal here. Goal number one, protect the community when released through notification and registration. And I'm sure many of you uh, have received sex offender notices. Hey, this guy's in your neighborhood. We get them all the time. Uh, what we found is now that sex offenders are being tracked post-release, and there's notification, we see what some people are calling sex offender ghettos emerge. So over here in the hilltop where we live, yeah, there's, you know, one uh, on the street over there. There's one down the street here. There's one up the street about three houses here. There's two over on Harris, right? So we're kept informed through these mailings that were surrounded by sex offenders and the, is, the push is to get them all into one neighborhood because let's face it, the people in, in Dublin, the people in Upper Arlington don't want to live next door to sex offenders, right? And they have the clout to get them sent to poor neighborhoods like the hilltop here or, or down in the bottoms in, in Franklinton. So many jurisdictions, you must register and notify law enforcement when they move. And, and Megan's Law developed a three-tier system of notification to Depending on the level of perceived risk, the assessed risk, low, moderate, or high, and who is notified and how they're notified depends on the level of risk. This is also kind of a state level phenomenon, so it varies from state to state. But at the highest risk level, the top tier in many states, the police have to go door to door and notify people in person that there's now a sex offender in their community. In Ohio, we, we, the, the bulk of the notification is via mailings. Now. Think about this, though, and, and let's play devil's advocate or exercise our critical thinking muscles as, as we've promised to do throughout the course. You know, if I commit a first-degree murder and, and serve, let's say, 30 years of, of a life sentence, right, I move back into a community. No one notifies anyone that there's this convicted murderer living there, but a convicted sex offender will require notification. Uh, and a lot of this has to do with the potential idea of recidivism and the fear that there will be additional victims that the person just can't stop victimizing. Right? Now goal number two, we're getting a real light show here. I'm sorry about that. Fascinating. Goal number two, protect the community by extending incarceration. Okay, well, what does this mean? Well. A clinician must decide if risk warrants involuntary commitment to a mental institution. And we've talked about states like California or the original case, Kansas versus Hendricks. You know, Hendricks does 20 years, says, I'm out of here. And they say, not so fast. You're going to the state mental hospital. And he says, no, you can't do that to me. And they say, well, yeah, we can. And the Supreme Court says we can. And we will. And you're going to stay in that mental institution until the doctors say that you're okay to get out. Now, there's two ways to determine the risk of reoffending, right? We can use an actuarial judgment, and this is insurance company type judgments. Great job being an actuarial. You calculate the potential odds of an occurrence, right? So actuarial judgment, we classify someone, we look at their history, and, and really it's putting them in a class, and, and then we say for this class, the
then there's a 66% chance of recidivism. We're not looking at the actual individual. We're only looking at the individual to the extent that we classify them, and then the statistics are applied to the class. Now, this is relatively accurate because it starts, you know, employing the law of large numbers, so the predictions become more solid. Clinical judgments about individuals on a case-by-case -case basis are notoriously inaccurate. But actuarial judgments are not all that comforting because if we say there's a 75% chance this person will, then there's a 25% chance they won't, and we can't really know which is which. Clinicians like to think they can predict, but we find that they're notoriously inaccurate. Now, critics like, and this was the, the core of Hendrick's case, was this amounts to double jeopardy. I've been punished for this crime. You can't punish me again. And, and the Supreme Court back, came back and said, putting you in a mental hospital is for treatment. It's not for punishment, Hendricks. So yes, we can. Yes, we will. And yes, we are. Right? So Supreme Court, no, it's t technically a civil commitment. It's not a criminal process at that point. So goal number two, then, pretend, uh, protect the community uh, by extending incarceration, that this is meant to uh, technically not meant to punish, but it's meant to treat so you can be reintegrated into society at some point in the future. Now, goal number three, provide treatment. The only problem is there's no real empirical de demonstration to the effectiveness of these treatments. Psychological counseling is often a condition of parole. Chemical castration is often said, ah, oh, just castrate the sons of bitches. And we probably all have family members that say, yeah, well, castrate them. And if the state won't do it, then me and my buddies will take them out in the alley and we'll take care of it. Well, that's fine. But one thing that probably bears understanding about sex crimes, like rape, if you will, is they're crimes of violence first and foremost. So even if someone is castrated, that doesn't mean that they're going to stop committing the violence, right? The sexual component, uh, as it was done in that specific manner, may no longer be possible, but there's other ways to get at that as well. So chemical castration is hormone therapy rather than physical castration. Is it effective? Well... I mean, there's mixed evidence, but it works best when it's the offender's idea. And if it's the offender's idea to undergo this, they're basically, I don't want to do this anymore, but I can't avoid my impulses. So if you give me hormones, then it should reduce my impulses, and it will make e me easier f uh, for me to toe the line. All right. So let's get to homework one then. Describe the possible differences in the public perception and reaction to sex offenses offenders compared to other serious offenders. Give at least three examples. And then I want you to help me out here because I don't talk about this hardly at all in Lecture 3, Theories of Crime. So how should I incorporate these ideas into Lecture 3? And if you want, you might want to bust this up into one person answers A and one person answers B. Might be a good way to go. Uh, look at the rest of the assignment as we get through the lecture. But I think it's, again, a, kind of a four-point issue. And I want to talk more about this in, in, in um Lecture 3, so maybe you can give me uh, some ideas on, on how to do that and how to make it real and how to make it useful. Okay. The death penalty. And we got quite a bit to say about that in, in this particular lecture. The death penalty could be considered the ultimate punishment. Now, it was declared unconstitutional in 1972. Furman versus Georgia was the case that led to that. Why? A lot of people say, well, they, they stood up and said, no cruel and unusual punishment per the Eighth Amendment of the Constitution. It has nothing to do with it. So uh, that, that is not really kind of the factual basis. It was applied to too many crimes. Juries didn't have proper guidance when sentencing, so the unreliability of the, the punishment was basically the problem. Uh, it was given willy-nilly with no real kind of tight boundary conditions where it should be employed or where it shouldn't be employed, and the trial process the often generated death penalty sentences was questionable at best. So, 
death penalty was <laughs> said no more death penalty in the United States. We're going to convert all death sentences to life sentences without parole, right? And the state legislature said, oh my God, we can't kill people anymore. Darn it. I want to kill people so bad, which is basically... <laughs> that they, they, they rushed to fix the problems and it came to the Supreme Court again in Greg versus Georgia and, and they said hey check it out this is our new death penalty procedure what do you think well what changed in those four, four years basically the death penalty was then applied only to murder right so kind of narrowed the range of cases it would be applied to and the decision was made that it would require a bifurcated trial and what that means is Guilt or innocence is decided by the jury first, right? So now, we find the defendant guilty. Cool. Now we're going to hear some additional evidence about the nature of the crime and the defendant's history, and we're going to then decide if the death penalty or some other sentence is warranted. So the jury first decides on guilt or innocence and then decides on punishment as two separate functions. So this is bifurcated the two-piece trial. Right? Now, how does this work then? Well, aggravating and mitigating factors have to be specified by statute and the juries then have to be instructed. So they say, hey look, these aggravating factors indicate that the death penalty is warranted, but these mitigating factors suggest that you should come back with a sentence less than the death penalty. And, you know, if someone was abused as a child, let's say they were sexually abused, uh, they were not parented well, uh, they had no education, we can go through and we can develop this list of mitigating factors that this person is essentially psychologically damaged from their childhood and I'm not sure that we want to then put them to death. Uh, they really got the raw end of the stick in their developmental process. It's often the way we, we look at the mitigation. All right? So then aggravating factors that would support a death penalty could be future dangerousness. Was there torture? Is it murder for hire, etc.? Murder of a police officer often warrants the death penalty, which is an interesting situation in some states because murder of a police officers automatic the death penalty is on the table whereas murder of a civilian it may not be which is strange in and of itself and then the mitigating factors these would support less than a death sentence so did they suffer childhood abuse mental illness and, and so we'll hear, hear from family testimony one of my friends I went to graduate school with John Harrison he actually spoke years ago in in our class uh, he lives in San Francisco and what does he do he was working for a law firm where he investigated defendant's history because this law firm handled the death penalty cases in California. He went and researched defendant history, interviewed defendants, interviewed their families, their schools, anyone who might have known them to develop a defense of mitigating factors. Great job for John. John is a guy who could talk to anyone and was really a social justice warrior. So he's out there fighting the good fight to maybe indicate that some people don't get raised in the best of circumstances and maybe the death penalty then is, is not necessarily fair. And, and I know that the death penalty is controversial. There's no two ways about it. The general formula, and there's going to be variations from state to state, is the general formula, the jury must unanimously agree on at least one aggravating factor, but the death penalty can be avoided if mitigating factors outweigh the aggravating factors. How that formula is presented is via the jury instructions. Right? So why the death penalty at all? Well, some people say, hey, it deters because you commit this crime, we're going to kill you. So there you go. It can provide a sense of closure. And that, uh, you know, f it is final. If the defendant is finally put to death, they will not recommit the fence. And many people feel at that point then justice has been done. If you take the life of my loved one, then you have no right to live. Right? So, so the sense of closure and or the retribution. Now, 
one of these arguments is subject to statistical analysis the others really don't right does the death penalty deter crime well what do we know a couple ways that we could get at this and I'm just going to show you two but there are other ways that this research could be conducted as well and has been we could compare murder rates in a state with or without the death penalty and we see no significant difference in murder rates but you say oh my god you know that 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 is like comparing apples to oranges because it's two different states but to the extent that we match states, you know, we're, we're kind of in quasi-experimental territory there, still kind of heavily relying on correlational research. Now, another way to get at that is to compare rates when a state first abolishes, then reinstates the death penalty. Do we see any reliable difference, statistically significant difference? Now, if we combine both these methods, then we might gain some illumination. Right. Now, the problem with the deterrence argument fundamentally, though, is remember that 75% of the killings and murders, these, these are the crimes that would be up for the death penalty potentially, are done in, in the heat of passion by people who know each other. So to what extent does a potential consequence or penalty prevent someone from... so? You know, in, in the heat of passion, if I'm in a state where it's life imprisonment versus I'm in a state where it's the death penalty, in the heat of passion, right, uh, do I say, well, I shouldn't kill this person because they have the death penalty, whereas if it's the life imprisonment, I say, yeah, it's okay to kill this person because it's life imprisonment. Note that the deterrence argument uh, really falls kind of flat on its face. Now, the sense of closure to the victim, this is something we can measure as well. Uh, sure. And, and then the retribution aspect is the unknown and the unknowable. Now, let's maybe look at the, the death penalty here from another angle, and that's mistakes and bias with the death penalty. Okay. So some states have imposed moratoriums. Uh, 87 people on death row have been exonerated by DNA. And, and this is all the rage now. And Barry Sheck's Innocence Project often heads this up. That is, we have people who have been sitting on death row for 10, 20, 30 years now. Right? Because a lot of states really don't want to kill people. That they, they maintain the death penalty, I guess, as a political demonstration, if nothing more. But as DNA technology becomes more available, lower cost, right? We, we're often finding that people didn't actually commit the crime, that DNA evidence fully exonerates them, and then we release them. This, this is a tough mistake to make, right? Columbia University study Mistakes were found in two-thirds of death penalty cases. And, and let's look at the type of the mistakes that were found in these death penalty cases. Now, this doesn't mean that the defendant was actually not guilty. What it means is there were mistakes made, so the verdict becomes unreliable to some degree. Of those, 37% had incompetent lawyers. And often, you know, people who've been given the death penalty... One of the reasons they got the death penalty because they're easy marks, so to speak. They don't have money. They're not educated. They don't have access to good attorneys. Why not go after them with the death penalty because they're less able to defend against it, right? If they're rich and they have high-powered attorneys, then we say we're not going to seek the death penalty because we'll never get it anyway, right? So 37% incompetent lawyers. 19% showed evidence of police misconduct. 20% showed faulty jury instructions. So mistakes happen, and part of the issue here is mistakes happen. Are we willing to put someone to death when we might have done so potentially based on or facilitated by mistakes that were made? But let's focus in on the jury instructions. And, and we talked about uh, jury instructions in the past. Uh, we'll be more specific now to, so this study by Lynch and Haney gave mock jurors comprehensive test of sentencing instructions in death penalty cases. What was the average score? And notice, this is slam dunky type research to do. This is super easy, right? This is just like giving exams in, in school. So the average score in this study, we see that 
the average score was 16.4 out of 35. That's 47 percent. And in most departments, most classes in this university, if you score 47 percent, that's akin to an E. Chemistry department notwithstanding with their stupid grading systems, right? Results for those who supported the death penalty versus those who did not might be of interest. So we get the sentencing instructions, and what we find is when we're confused, we often then, when we're confused, we don't understand what's going on, then we often start looking at peripheral cues uh, that are irrelevant to the facts of the case, but inform us to make the decision. So if I don't really understand my instructions and I don't understand the case that I'm hearing, then we know that length of presentation might then favor the prosecution if the prosecution has the longer presentation. The attractiveness of attorneys could bias us. That, that we might find the attractive attorney more preferable to the unattractive attorney. We might use race as a peripheral cue right? and, and more willing to give a white defendant a break than a black defendant. Okay. So, race is a peripheral cue then. Lynch and Haney tested this idea. Half saw blocked black defendant in the mock trial, half saw white defendant, and they all gave their sentencing decisions. After the comprehension test, they split the subjects by how well they had done high uh, comparison group and low comprehension group. Uh, did the sentence differ for the two groups? So what they've done is... The first manipulation, the first independent variable, right? The, only, the independent variable is race of defendant. But everything else is held constant. And now they give the jury instructions, they do the test on the jury instructions, and they split the participants into high comp comprehending people and low comprehending people. Okay? So we have high comp black, high comp white, low comp black, low comp white. It's a two by two design. One independent variable, one individual difference variable. What do we find? Well, we see in the high comprehension groups, they did not attend to the race as a peripheral cue. So, and consider this then the control condition, if you will. 10% death penalty, uh, this is the percent of death penalty verdicts, and they came in at about 46, 47% in the high comprehension. But notice, race had no influence. Now, what happens, though, when you get those low comprehension jurors that don't really understand the instructions? Well, we see that they are essentially similar for the white defendant. Maybe drop a little bit. I doubt this difference is significant here, but here's where the significant difference is. For a black defendant, they're far more willing under this case. That is 60% as opposed to 47% seeking the death penalty. And again, this goes back to the necessity of how well educated or trained, whichever way you want to go on that, because you guys did some really good work in your assignment on this and, and, and considering that idea. To what extent, how do we then ameliorate this issue? Do we do it through training? Do we do, we do it through jury testing, etc.? You guys had a bunch of fantastic ideas uh, in the previous assignment where we discovered that. So, what we're saying is, if you have kind of a low education jury and you're black, it's probably not going to work out too well for you. So, racial bias in death penalty sentencing, chances of, of death penalty higher for killers of whites than killers of blacks. And now we're getting back to that issue of victim race, as I promised we would do. Why? Major factor is the prosecutor's discretion and not the jury's. Another hidden power of the prosecutors. So let's take a look at this. We have four possible combinations. Now, when a white killed a black, the death penalty request, this is prosecutor seeking the death penalty, we see when a white person kills a black about 15% of the time, in that case, the uh, the prosecutors requested the death penalty. When black killed a black, it's about the same. So isn't this interesting? Because we would expect that it's the defendant that drives that decision. It isn't. It really, we have to look towards the victim, right? When a white killed a white, we see then a difference of approaching about 19% from about 15%. But notice what happens when a black kills a white. Now we jump up to 70% of the prosecutor seeking the death penalty. Uh, most of us researchers, you know, only dream of effect sizes so large as what we're observing here. 
Right? Again, the hidden power of the prosecutor uh, has been kind of a theme throughout at least the last half of this course, and we can see it played out in many different uh, fashions. So problems with death qualification. Now, what is the death qualification process? Let's suppose that we are brought into a trial where the death penalty is possible. And one of the questions that can be asked, right, is do you have any extreme beliefs about the death penalty that would prevent you from being impartial about the death penalty? And during voir dire, if I'm sitting there, remember voir dire? Okay, they ask me this question. I'm sitting there in voir dire. And they say, hey, Mark, do you have any uh, extreme beliefs about the death penalty that would prevent you from being impartial about the death penalty? And I would look at them and say, yeah, I don't believe in the death penalty, and I won't give the death penalty. I believe it's immoral. I believe it's wrong. I, I won't go there. And they'll say, well, thank you for your honesty. You're dismissed. So note, a anyone that feels that the death penalty is an egregious offense or an immoral offense or whatever says, no death penalty, can't do it, won't do it, we're not on the jury anymore. We've all been dismissed from the jury on the basis of this question. So now what we're left with is a jury where there are people who are willing to endorse the death penalty. Now, you can see essentially why this needs to be done. Do you want to give a trial where you have one person who won't give the death penalty no matter what? Do you want to give a trial where the death penalty is on the table with that one person who won't do it? You already know the outcome. The death penalty will not be given because all it takes is one person to say, I won't do it, on the jury. So on the one hand, I understand the logic of doing this. <laughs> but then on the other hand, being adamantly opposed to the death penalty in all circumstances, I believe that as a citizen I should have the right to be on this jury as well. So, boy, you talk about a dilemma, you guys figure it out. I, I don't know what to say about it. So it's blatantly tilted in favor of the prosecution. Someone who can't vote for it is excluded, but someone who can is included, and that does then play into the prosecution's hands. But why is it a problem? Well, remember that we have a bifurcated trial, so we're going to determine guilt and then we're going to determine whether the death penalty is on the table. The problem is, the people who are willing to endorse the death penalty might in fact process the information differently leading up to the guilt or innocence phase. So, extends to the guilt phase even though it's supposed to be irrelevant. So the death qualification process then, favor the prosecution, mistrustful of defendants, more punitive. So people who are death qualified are more likely to find guilt than not. Right? So study with two types of mock juries. In this case what they did is they asked people the questions so they build just death qual uh, qualification jurors or mix set right, not death qualified and death qualified. Each type of jury heard the same evidence. The death qualified juries found the defendant guilty 75% of the time. The mixed juries found the guilt 53% of the time. So what happens is death qualification, that question, creates a narrowed, a less diverse jury pool that is more likely to find guilt the first phase of the trial. Uh, and, and that's problematic. Who isn't death qualified? Well, uh, more likely to be black, more likely to be women, are less likely to endorse the death penalty. And I don't know that that comes as any great surprise. Right? Lockhart versus McCree, the, the American Psychological Association, uh, gave a brief, an amicus curiae, uh, and, and against the death qualification. They summarized 30 years of evidence. But the Supreme Court comes back and says, hey, as long as people say they'll be conscientious and find fact, that's all that matters. So don't bother me with your empirical demonstrations of the effect of bias. We don't want to hear it. As long as people say they won't be biased, we're good to go. Reminiscent of Ohio rule number nine as it regarded pretrial publicity. So... Should we shift gears a little bit? Let's talk about death row then. Where is it? At year end 2018, a total of 30 states and the Federal Bureau of Prisons held 2,628 prisoners under sentence of death. Now this is 75% uh, 
folks, 75 less, 3% fewer than at year end of 2017. Now, eight states executed a total of 25 prisoners in 2018. Texas, man, Texas loves their death penalty, and Texas is one of the few states that employs it with uh, kind of exceeding rapidity, right, uh, for more than half of the 13 executions. Now, the number of prisoners under death sentence by race, because this is where uh, it becomes important too, that we see in 2010, 1,700 white, 1,309, uh, 1,309 black, 87 other. And what do we see as we go on? Notice that the relationship pretty much holds throughout. Now, is there a problem with this? Well, when you think about the proportion of blacks versus whites in the population, this is an amazingly skewed statistic. But remember, are we surprised? Because the prosecutors are far more likely, they're three or four times more likely to seek the death penalty when the defendant is black than white. So, female prisoners, let's just do, let's, let's be fair and, and look at the genders here. But now, look at the numbers for males. What we're saying is in 2018, we had uh, 1,400, this is 2,400, about 2,500, uh, maybe 2,600, give or take some rough math there. 2,600 men on death row in 2018. For women, oh, well, this is what? 2017, 2018, so the same time period, and, and what we see is uh, the, the federal, there's, there's one, right, one white woman on, on death row, but we see a total of 53. Wow, that's astounding. 2,600 versus 53. Is there a gender effect in seeking the death penalty? And metting it out, it appears so. But man, people love their death penalty. And uh, I had to change the slide. This was from the last iteration. Uh, execution marathon planned. Uh, well, no, it's not planned anymore. It's carried out. And, and Asa Hutchinson, right, Arkansas governor, was afraid in election year that Trump might lose and something might happen to their precious death penalty. So they went on a killing spree. And uh, Arkansas, right, put to death 17, seven prisoners in an 11-day period. And you can read more about the original story if you want to check that link. Okay. So uh, the death penalty exists. It exists in the majority of the states. And a lot of folks are really charged up to use it. Now, part two of homework 10. And I'm going to, I've asked this question in our meetings, but I notice, you know, we don't have, a, you know, everyone attending the meetings. So I want to ask the question again. And I want to ask it in a more general sense for this homework assignment, and then in a more specific sense. What is an acceptable error rate in jury decision making? And you say, well, okay, what kind of error? And there, there is actually two errors, and there's a type 1 error, which means we said that the defendant was guilty when they were, in fact, not guilty. That's a type 1 error. The type 2 error, as you imagine, is the opposite. That is, we found the defendant not guilty when, in fact, they were guilty. Right? Now, most of the time, we focus more stringently on the type 1 error because that would be imprisoning someone who didn't deserve it. Right? So, but what I want you to do for this is, within your team, maybe discuss this out right? and, and come to some kind of agreement. Or, if you can't come to an agreement, then average your numbers. And so, what is acceptable, right, and what isn't? Now, I'm going to add a bit more context to the second part of this question. What error rate for type 1 should be the threshold to encourage the actual change in policy? So note, what I'm asking you, if you want to just take it easy on, on the first part of the question and say, well, obviously in, in Part A, uh, only a 0% error rate is acceptable. Fine. Got it. That would be the thing to say. All right? But let me ask in terms of the second part here, Part B. That's fine. But what error rate should actually instigate us to make a change in policy? And that is, you might say, we prefer zero error rate, but we're not going to do anything if that error rate is below 3%. At what point should an error rate cause a change in behavior? 
motivate a change in behavior? Different question, and I think a more important question when you get right down to it. Of course, I would think it's a more important question because I freaking wrote the, wrote the question, but that aside, right? Should, now, and here's the second part to question B, right? Should that differ for the death penalty as opposed to non-death sentences? And let's have a paragraph or two discussing this idea. Because let's face it, we can let someone out. If we make a mistake and they were, in, you know, they got a 30-year sentence, and we find after 10 years DNA evidence exonerates them, and they served 10 years for a crime they didn't commit, maybe we can throw some money at them and hope all is good. It's not, but if we put someone to death, there's no redo, there's no do-over, there's no way to fix that. So for part A, fine, think normal crime. For part B. Does it change your mind when we have the death penalty on the table? Now, we've talked an awful lot about kind of retribution-based uh, justice here. Restorative justice seeks to repair the harm caused by the crime. And uh, yes, there are other types of justice. What I'd like you to do, uh, if you wish and you have time, check out the restorativejustice.org. And these are the folks that explore potential ideas in terms of how can we bring especially perpetrators and victims together, right? And res develop a sense of closure and forgiveness, right? And rehabilitation that facilitates the growth of our community and society in general. So you can check that out. Now I want to talk about the intuitive prosecutor mindset here for a little bit. It's a motivated attribution style that processes information in ways that favor drawing certain conclusions over others. If you remember the Rucker et al. research I talked about where the researchers manipulated arrest rates to cause people to believe that crime was out of control or that crime was in control. And we saw those people who thought crime was out of control became increasingly punitive. They had entered into an intuitive prosecutor mindset. That is, we got to clamp down. We got to come down hard because we're losing our grip on society. Shit's out of control. And that justifies coming down harder. Right? Now, the psychological mechanism really is, is kind of fascinating in that it allows us to weight evidence. If I determine that things are out of control and therefore this person has to pay, you know, as an example, as a general deterrent to show we mean business, then their alibi, I might give it less and less credence. That is, it has less and less impact on me and evidence of their guilt then has increasing impact and that's the way this works it's an actual fascinating cognitive phenomenon is we begin to weight exculpatory evidence lower and lower and assign greater and greater weight to inculpatory evidence thus justifying us arriving at our final goal which is to punish someone anyone because we believe crime is out of control Right. Now notice that moral outrage operates in the same way. To the extent a crime angers me, I may be less willing to listen to excuses and alibis. So part three, and this is for every team member, right, to answer individually. So I want to see four response, five responses, one from each of you, because it's a personal issue. What crime has the potential to turn you into an intuitive prosecutor? What type of crime can cause you to go, I don't give a shit? I don't want to hear their excuses. We don't need a trial. We need to trot them into the back alley and do away with them right here and now. Right? What are the ones that cause you to tip over the edge from the rational scientist, the, the fair judge, to become the intuitive prosecutor? And I'm going to give you an example. This is not necessarily reflective of my calmed down ultimate reaction, but it's more like my initial knee-jerk emotional reaction. And for me, it's torturing of animals. Someone tortures an animal, hey, I'm sorry. I, I don't know what to do. I don't, you can't give me an excuse for torturing an animal. You sit there and intentionally harm this animal for, through torture. That's like, I don't give a shit. You can make all the excuses in the world. 
You need to pay. You need to suffer for your crime. And I'll tell you what, if, you want, if you're willing to torture that animal for your own enjoyment, then I think your punishment should be the same type of torture. Right? And, and if it's a second offense, man, you, you just go. Find another planet to live on. And I, I know that sounds harsh, right? But what I'd like you to do is what are your hot buttons? What, are the, what, what is the offense that pushes you beyond the edge? That, that you can't even like keep a grip on yourself anymore. And I think one of the values of this assignment, I'm hoping, it's the first time I've ever used this question, and I'll read your responses. But I, th I think one of the ideas here, one of my goals in asking this is for us to understand other people. That is that the nature of crime and how we respond to it can have cultural components, can have community components, but it also has a strong individual bias to it. And, and for me, torturing animals is just over the top. There, there is just no purpose for this, right? And, and remember, if, if we can't see a purpose, if we can't see a profit, then, then maybe we're willing to now start to call it evil. And that's where we're going to go in Lecture 16, is, is talk evil. Right? So data on incarceration, who's being put in prison and to what extent? U.S. federal correction facilities held an estimated 1.5 million, almost 1.6 million prisoners in 2013, an increase of 4,300 prisoners from 2012. The three-year decline in prison population stopped in 2013 due to the increase of 6,300 inmates in the state prison population. The federal prison decreased in size for the first time in 1980, 1,900 fewer prisoners in 2013 than 2012. And these numbers have not varied recently. So the number of prisoners sentenced to more than a year in state or federal prisons increased by 5,400 persons from 2012 to 2013. Right? The number of persons admitted to state or federal prison during 2013 increased from 4%. What the hell? And we know that we imprison more people in the United States as a percentage of our population than any other industrialized nation in the world, by far. Man, the United States loves its prisons, and it loves to put people in prison to a greater extent than any other industrialized nation. What is it with the United States, right? Well, recidivism and psychopathy, we about it. Three years, 50% of psychopaths in the sample offended with only 25% of the non-psychopaths. Psychopathy might be a good indicator of recidivism, and psychopaths by and large, thought to be untreatable and probably need to be in prison, right? So, treated psychopaths high in factor one offended at higher rates, 86% than non-treated. So those people who are high in primary trait type psychopathy, we give them treatment, they actually reoffend more so than if we'd not treated them. And this is according to Herodol, and, and they're the experts on this. Hemphill et al. did a meta-analysis and found, found the psychopaths uh, to offend at an average rate of three to one over non-psychopaths. So while I might make a case against mass incarceration, there may be certain aspects of the population that we have little in the way of choice. And now notice that I'm talking more of an incapacitation. These psychopaths don't seem to be able to toe the line. We don't be able to seem to treat them. They seem to, you know, reoffend at a, at a fantastic rate. Maybe for the protection of society, they just need to be incapacitated, and, and prison is our go-to for doing that. So, hidden costs of prosecution. Well, we saw how jails extort the poor, and we viewed that. So there's a link in case you missed that. Let us then think about, for example, costs. The costs of of. I will say this though, and uh, consider this carefully: that the death penalty costs more than life imprisonment. The death penalty carries with it a lot of legal machinations, appeals, etc., special uh, facilities. So really, when we say, well, if we put them to death, it'll be a savings, no, that, that is incorrect. That is a myth. When we put people to death, it's more expensive than keeping them in prison for life. Right? So let's just get that cost 
off the table here. Brian Stevenson on injustice, well, just mercy. So some of you read this book and for your, for your book report. And for those who didn't, here's a link to a TED Talk uh, from Brian Stevenson uh, discussing his experiences. So I thought I'd include that for you in case you want to check that out, having not read that book. I mean, eight books had to choose, but that leaves some good books unread, perhaps. Now, let's get to costs again. Corrections Corporation of America. In 1983, our company became the first to provide privatized prison, jail, and detention services. For more than three decades, we've strived to aid governments by reducing costs, alleviating overcrowding, and providing quality correctional care for inmates and detainees. Notice detainees, those people who are in pretrial detainment. We've discussed that up one side and down the other, right? Our approach to public private partnership and correction combines the cost savings and innovation of private sector with the strict guidelines consistent through public sector. This continues to produce proven results or not, right? And this is what we tell investors, and, and the Correction Corporation of America is renamed. Uh, I've gone to my financial guy, you know, for my meager savings, my 401k or 403b, etc. And I say, look, Phil, I really don't want to invest my retirement money in any private prisons. Can you assure me that none of my money, you know, is being invested in private prison corporations. And, and he said, well, no, of course it is. And I said, can you assure me? I mean, I know you don't think it is, but are you willing to do the work? And he came back to me and he said, Mark, I don't know what to tell you. I don't, it's, it's almost impossible to invest in standard investment strategies without investing in private prisons. Most of them are tied up in real estate kind of, uh, sectors of investment and they've been changing their names because they found that people don't want to invest in prison so now they change their names so that they aren't as obvious as correction corporation to me the the idea that people are profiting over the incarceration of their fellow citizens is abhorrent and, and you know I mean, I'll state my opinion and I'll call it for what it is it's an opinion you may disagree and, and that's okay now, as far as in producing superior outcomes, no, there's no empirical support for that. Right? So it's, it's just a way to get rich. And notice that if I'm one of the 1% and I want to invest in these companies heavily, then as a 1%, I might pay lobbyists to lobby for more stringent laws so that we can, or more uh, hardcore enforcement of laws or longer sentences so that we can make more money in the prisons. Notice it sets up this myriad of conflicts of interest. Uh, so I'm definitely not a supporter of the private uh, prison industry. And as someone who teaches organizational psychology, <laughs> when we get down to what organizations say they do and what they actually do, and in org psych, offered every fall, <laughs> We talk about espoused values, what people say, versus enacted values, what they do. And we often see with organizations, there's an incredible distance between the two. Okay. So there's a, a, a saying often shared among CCA employees, we've got each other's backs. Well, and okay, so I can understand kind of the us versus them mentality, especially within a prison. I'm not saying it's an easy job. I think it's going to be a tough job, especially the way it's done now. Each CCA facility is like a small town. Our correctional facilities feature kitchens, dining halls, places of worship, classrooms, vocational training centers, healthcare clinics, recreational areas, housing units, administrative offices, and more. Working together, we provide hundreds of services and perform countless tasks uh, every day. Teamwork is a way of life for CCA employees, how we make it to work in providing the industry's highest quality, safety, and security around the clock. I don't know that that's the case. That's what they say they do. Uh, but they often then will turn around and brag, you know, to their shareholders. We found a way to feed inmates on 26 cents a day. Uh, when it becomes a for-profit motive, they're not going to be spending lavishly on the prisoners. Let's just face it. That, that's just reality. So what they say and what actually happens. Now, is that to say that state prisons, federal prisons, county jails are better? 
Not necessarily. But to the extent that we want to put this responsibility of incapacitating or uh, meeting out retribution or attempting to rehab rehabilitate offenders, uh, to what extent do we want to give this to private businesses whose primary orientation is not the welfare of the prisoner, but is the welfare of the shareholder, that they must remain profitable? I don't, I don't know that that can be done successfully. So, something to consider uh, in, in private corrections. Is that the way to go? You know, I just read this morning about uh, the space vehicle that will be used to land on the moon in the future and how NASA has given these contracts to private industry and is that a successful process? Uh, privatization is, you know, lauded in, in many different domains. But is prisons, corrections, rehabilitation the place where we think it's appropriate? And I don't know. Leave it to you guys. Anyway, that's the end of this. It's brought to you by Incarceration Nation, if you will. Remember, we're the leaders. We put more people in prison than any other country. And think about what that might say about us. Why would we need to do that? I mean, if we as a country are doing things so well, then why do we have the highest per capita incarceration rate? Those two don't seem to me like they necessarily line up. You do your exploration, do your thinking, do your critical thinking, remember, and, and that's it. So this is the last homework assignment embedded in this one. I got one more lecture. Uh, believe it or not, there is one or two questions on, on the last quiz that are in uh, lecture 16. So, uh, and it's got a lot of video. We'll be presenting lecture 16 via... Uh, Our, our Buckeye Cloud rather than YouTube because I've got some copyrighted material in there that I don't think YouTube will allow. So that one will be presented a little differently and we're going to get to that shortly. You guys have a great day.